Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get to it. Uh, it is the 11th, and you are in the middle of your first Project One milestone, okay? How many of you have started the project? Okay, awesome. That's great. Fantastic. Um, a lot of this week's work will kind of be just kind of getting used to Unreal Engine, uh, getting in there and implementing your interaction system. Um, how many of you were at the career fair on Monday? Okay. If you weren't there for the Monday lecture, you're going to want to go back and you're going to want to watch, maybe even on double speed, uh, that lecture. Okay. We spent about half of it building the first part of your interaction system. Um, if you recall, for those of you who were there, we got basically to a, a pretty cool point um, where we are constantly doing a line trace out into the map. And when we hit an actor, we put that actor into an actor variable. That's a really powerful place to be. We can now do things to that actor uh, when we detect that the trigger has been pulled. And today, we're going to finish up our interaction system by introducing the topic of affordances, okay? This idea that any given object can have a certain bit of logic kind of attached to it, okay? So if you've got a little block that is acting as a light switch in your scene, we want to add an affordance that allows us to turn some other actors, light actors, off or on or off or on, okay? We're going to do that today. Uh, we're going to finish setting up your system, uh, and that should take you kind of toward the end uh, of your P1 milestone, okay? There are a couple other things you need to do uh, but there's a big hints column, uh, and you'll be able to get that done pretty easily, I think. Okay? Um, all right. Uh, you're currently also breaking those tasks out into uh, into little tasks in JIRA. Okay? You've got your JIRA set up, hopefully. Um, and we're also working on your Culture 1. Has anyone already watched The Matrix and done the essay? Okay. Awesome. I love it when uh, when you all show up to watch the film together. Um, it's really fun. We talk a little bit about it beforehand and a little bit afterward. You get a lot more out of the film when you do that, in my opinion. And uh, on Monday, we're not going to have a normal lecture. We're not going to be in here. Uh, we're going to be someplace else, probably someplace in Dow, at about 8 p.m., and we'll be watching the film together. You go to that, and uh, you're going to get full points, okay? Pretty easy. Um, I do recommend eating 
uh, dinner before you go, okay? There's not going to be any food there. It's about, I think it's about two hours long, okay? And um, yeah, it should be a pretty good time. I have a company to show you. This is one of my favorite companies. Uh, this is an XR startup that you've, I think you've already seen a little bit um, in the, uh, on the first day. This is a startup created by my friend Christina York uh, a number of years ago. And the entire engineering team, uh, for the most part, has been X 494 students and uh, Wolverine Soft students. Um, now, that's mostly because uh, the company was created long before this course existed and long before ARI, A-R-I, uh, club existed. Um, but uh, if you want a reminder of what the company is, let's go ahead and take a look at this video. It's a really good tool to, to help distract them and keep their mind off of whatever anxiety they might have. Uh, we, we also, also use it for different. long procedures or for long stays when patients can't leave their room. The greatest thing that I've seen come out of augmented reality is watching patients and their parents react at the same time and reacting together and both kind of celebrating that. They get to have a moment of joy in a place that could just be overwhelming. Some of them started with books, but it's really about creating whole worlds of imagination for children. So uh, something I've forgotten that is really cool about this product is that in that form that you saw, the pop-up book form, um, it really is something that you kind of struggle to do by yourself, right? They said that a lot of the magic comes when the parent and the child both have a good time together, and they're both distracted from the kind of medical situation at the same time. Um, so it is, uh, it's pretty interesting. The company has since moved away from pop-up books. I can tell you this because I was involved in the early stages. Um, they initially, uh, their business model was they would provide the software for free, uh, and they would actually sell copies of the pop-up books and that, uh, the sale of the books is how they would fund themselves. Um, that very quickly turned out to not work. Okay. I forget exactly what the issue was. Um, but Basically, a medical clinic would purchase like one or two copies of the books, and that would be it. They would use those books for like a thousand patients, uh, and that was a bit of an issue, right? That's kind of uh, it. Reminds me of the the uh, has anyone does anyone remember Blockbuster video game rentals? So right, I'm uh, the game dev professor, and uh, and so one big issue when the video game rental market uh, got going. Uh, is that you would spend years, right, uh, blood, sweat, and tears working on a game, and you'd want to sell it for about $50, $60. Well, um, Blockbuster would purchase one copy of your game, uh, and then they would rent that out to a 1,000 customers. Who gets all the money from all those uh, 1,000 customers? Yeah. Yeah, Blockbuster Basically, man in the middle, uh, your game product, you get one sale, they get a thousand, okay? And so no game developers liked Blockbuster. Uh, in Japan, that was actually illegal. A tiny fun bit of trivia, one of the reasons the old school, like 80s and 90s era games are so difficult is because the game developers fought back by basically making you have to play the game for a long time to clear it. Uh, which reduces the economic incentive to get a rental versus a purchase. Anyway, that's a big tangent, okay? Um, the company intelligently recognized they have a, a business model problem, and they moved on to a different product. Now they do a product that is a bit more of a scavenger hunt, and I believe they sell software licenses 
on a per patient basis. Um, and so uh, you kind of see that here, right? A sticker, an XR, an AR sticker gets put around the hospital. The students uh, can walk around, sorry, the uh, patients can walk around, uh, scan these stickers, get characters into the game where they can then interact with them, meet them, train them up, take care of them, and play with them in mini games. okay? Arrive at a health center, you want to be welcoming, you receive care, empowering, you return home, you build trust. Um, and so uh, Spellbound is also the kind of thing that you can take home, for instance. You can take it home and continue to engage and walk around and exercise there. So your patients don't have to hate the wait. Spellbound creates AR games specifically designed to engage and distract patients uh, when they're waiting, okay? Uh, it improves the point of care experience, keeps the experience positive, okay? People don't have to fear coming to the hospital anymore. Uh, maybe uh, little kids won't... Uh, won't uh, be afraid of it. They'll want to go so that they can interact with their characters, okay? Um, innovating at home, so uh, envisions a world where patient engagement doesn't end when patients leave the hospital. So if a doctor really needs a patient to be walking around and moving to finish their rehab, they can kind of watch that and make sure that happens at the hospital. But at home, they kind of lose that ability, right? So how do you keep the patients moving around and rehabilitating when they leave the institution, when they leave the grounds. Um, and this is one way, okay? So they've got a blog here, right? Um, they're writing uh, fairly actively. So Christina uh, wrote this blog uh, in June, so not that long ago. We had one in May, April. It looks like they're writing one about every month. As we talked about last time, uh, you do this uh, to, you know, contribute to the public knowledge a little bit. But another big reason you do this uh, is to improve your SEO, right? When someone, when a, a medical professional is looking uh, for interesting technology solutions to the medical problems they have at their clinic or their hospital, you want Spellbound to show up near the top, okay? You want it on that first page. If you do, there's a good chance you might make a sale, find another partner, uh, and all that good stuff, Okay. Um, so, in terms of partnerships, uh, actually, let's uh, let's see if we can find it, find anything. Okay, you can see some footage there of the product, cost effective, blah 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 blah. It looks like they're not listing it, uh, but they uh, they work with and have some business. I think with University of Michigan Hospital. No surprise, they're right there in downtown Ann Arbor. Um, they did a mural and some custom work for the Stanford Health System as well, and I think they've got some stuff going on in Cleveland. Uh, but I do wish that they would list out all of their partners. Uh, maybe they do, and I just missed it, um, or I'm not finding it. Um, we do have quite a bit uh, of stuff to do today, so I do want to move on. One thing I wish uh, this website had was I wish it had a bit more information about how they make their money. Um, I'm pretty sure it's software licenses, and I could email Christina, and she'd probably tell us. Um, but uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. You can't really figure it out from the website here. Um, but uh, anyway, right? So kind of an interesting company, kind of a novel idea. Um, it is the kind of thing that is hard to do without XR. Um, so a traditional 2D game. How are you going to get people up and walking if you do that? Um, the act of forcing people to walk around their location, scan things, and then engage with the things that they've scanned. Um, it's kind of Pokemon Go style, right? I remember when Pokemon Go really blew up in, I think, 2016. One of the common jokes, right, is that this is uh, finally getting gamers walking around their community, uh, having exercise and engaging with people, right? That's kind of playing into the stereotype, uh, but uh, it, uh, it was a big thing, right? You had people just running around parks. Uh, you had people walking around. Do you remember that time? It was very common to see people just downtown, downtowns that used to be empty and vacant. You'd see groups of three or four people walking around, you know, staring deeply into their phone, which maybe wasn't super safe, but at least they were walking around uh, and, uh, you know, enjoying the day. Okay. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, pretty cool company. I, uh, I think they're having difficulties expanding this business model, uh, but they're hanging in there. Uh, and if you want to go say hi to them, uh, I think their office is in Ann Arbor Spark downtown near Liberty Plaza. And you can, yeah, you can just see them walking around and say hi. And uh, it's pretty cool stuff. 
All right. Uh, so, uh, and I think they've got funding. They've won some events, and they've uh, they've got some some venture capital. I think they've got about one million dollars in funding or so. Not a ton uh, for a company like this, but um, but it's something. All right. So you are getting into Unreal Engine in this project. You've been working in Unity a little bit, the exploration AR, uh, tutorial AR assignments. Um, these software packages are are big. Okay, they are complicated. There's a lot going on in them. And while you will get better at all of this, it might feel a bit overwhelming right now. Yeah. So I want you to know that there are students like throughout the world that are going through a similar experience that are getting lost in these big software packages, whether it's Unreal or Unity or Blender or Maya. Okay. Um, and uh, I wanted to show you this fun little little video. Uh, basically, it's it's something of a tradition to complain about these pieces of software and all the things they can do. Um, nevertheless, they can do a lot, and it's worth it's worth learning. It's worth immersing yourself. Uh, so let's uh, let's go ahead and take a listen. This might sound very familiar uh, if you've heard uh, of a similar song called "Welcome to the Internet." This is called "Welcome to 3D Software." All right. So a lot of fun in jokes and more of these will make sense as you get more immersed in doing what you're doing, making games, uh, getting into 3D modeling, stuff like that. Um, a pretty fun video. Um, I saw this in a Wall Street Journal today, uh, this morning. Um, uh, and it's more validation uh, that companies that have been kind of skeptical of VR for a while um, are beginning to find these interesting kind of more niche use cases for the technology. Um, this is uh, Walmart uh, basically using VR uh, to put their employees directly into uh, like customer confrontation situations. So what happens if someone walks in having a very bad day and is confrontational or is threatening? How do you handle that? It's much, much safer if you can uh, get the employees practicing these scenarios in an environment where they won't actually get hurt, okay, or hurt the customer uh, or anything like that. Um, so uh, a lot of companies are finding uh, training uh, to, be, uh, to be a very useful use of VR, um, and this is something that is being used across very different organizations, right? Um, so financial companies are using it in a similar way. UPS is using it. This was really funny. They have a scenario uh, to train their UPS drivers in what to do if a dog attack happens, right? Um, what do you do in that case? Uh, 
but you've also got Volvo using it. You've got Walmart. So it seems to me that this kind of educational use uh, of uh, VR is something that uh, many, many different companies, uh, even across industries, are finding useful. So kind of interesting. And a reminder, okay, you are using these VR headsets a lot. Um, please make sure when you're done uh, that the VR headset is nice and organized. And importantly, get the cable off the ground, okay? When you're done, get that cable up or off the ground. Try and wrap it around the headset a little bit if you can. Uh, please avoid this, okay? Don't let the cable just kind of droop onto the ground, okay? What happens is that you let it droop. Suddenly, people are stepping on the cable. Suddenly, people are rolling over the cable in their chairs. And if that cable gets wrecked, like that headset, that headset is thousands of dollars, okay? Uh, and uh, we do not want to have to replace that and fix that up, okay? So be careful. Don't let this stuff hit the ground, and you'll be just fine, all right? Okay, so our main objective today is to finish up our project one uh, kind of unreal blueprint affordance interaction system, okay? And after this is done, you'll find it relatively straightforward to add interactions uh, to your objects in the scene, which is what you need to do this week and especially next week, all right? So we're going to get that done. Then we're going to return and finish up talking about game engines in general, Okay. <laughs> And then uh, we're going to dive deeper into what programming is like in Unreal uh, and how you can easily do things with blueprints, with nodes. It's going to take a while for you to get used to programming in this visual scripting language, right? How many of you are, are actually kind of liking it? Like you kind of like this visual scripting, blueprints, nodes. You like the fact that you can search for a node and there's a nice list. There's no mistyping anything, right? It has some positives. How many of you are kind of annoyed at the uh, the visual blueprint scripting? It's verbose and it's slow. It's kind of hard to read, right? I'll tell you, you may never love blueprint scripting, but the more you do of it, the faster you will move, and I think you'll come to eventually appreciate it, okay? All right. Okay, well, let's go ahead and, uh, and get started. I got to get my headset uh, just rolling a little bit here, uh, so give me just a moment how many of you have kind of have kind of gotten into the uh, the rhythm? Like you're you you're putting it on your head now. You can bring it up to program, bring it down right to test. You've got that going, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, that will make development a lot easier. <clears throat> okay. There we go. All right. So headset plugged in. I'm going to reopen Unreal Engine when I get my cursor back. Hello. Okay, let that open up. The portal open up. Good. Okay, my operating system knows about the headset now. Got to open up the project. It looks like there's another update for Unreal available. Um, so one of the tough things about this course is the more dependencies a course has, just like the more dependencies your software has, uh, the more the ground shifts underneath you. Okay? Um, it seems like there are some differences in the assignment specs and the guides, right, uh, than what's in the editor. Have any of you noticed that? There are some little differences. Some things are renamed. Some things are moved around a bit. Um, it's hard to keep up with all that stuff and keep it completely up to date because you'll fix it and synchronize it. And then next week, Unreal comes out with a new version, everything different, okay? And not just Unreal, but Unity is shifting as well. Um, and in my game engine architecture course, you've got a new version of SDL out, right? The libraries are advancing. Uh, and so that's something to keep in mind. And this is general purpose. The more dependencies that you have, the more the ground is like, uh, is like quicksand, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, all right. Okay, so we've got our uh, project right here. Um, I want to uh, remind you about what we accomplished last time. We have our VR pawn, okay? And inside of our VR pawn, uh, you've got everything that you expect, right? You've got all this stuff that makes the finger animations work, and you've got um, your hands, right? But right here at the bottom, we have something new, okay? We have an event tick event. Now, a reminder, every frame of your simulation, every frame of your game 
this event is going to execute. And we're going to come out of the white line and we're going to run into this node right here, determine hovered active. Recall, we actually programmed this node together, okay? This node is a function uh, that takes no parameters and it has no return value. And if we double click it, we can go into that function, we can see how it works. We emerge from this pink node and we run a line trace. We do some 3D vector math in order to line trace out into the distance in front of whatever we're pointing at. Now, when we hit something with our line trace, this line trace function has a little output node, okay? It returns a hit structure. We can break that hit open and we can grab all sorts of data telling us about our interaction. Um, in particular though, we just want the actor for now. So we get that actor and we set our variable current hovered actor to be that actor, okay? Now uh, we print the name of whatever we're hovering over, okay? And that's how we know that it's working. So let's go ahead and uh, let's do that. Let's just make sure it's working the way we expect. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, click this, get our controllers working, and then just verify everything is going okay. All right? Okay, right? So I've uh, got my line trace. It's pretty glitchy for me right now. I might have to, uh, I might have to, to uh, quit Firefox or something to get our performance back. But you can see if I point at the pretzel, the print message says pretzel. Uh, if I point at the cube, we get to see the cube, right? Sphere, right over there, all right? Pistol, right there, okay? So it's working exactly how we expect, which is fantastic. All right, so let's take a quick look uh, at what we wanna do today, all right? Um, we now have an interaction system. Well, we have a selection system. We can now select an object, point at it, right? And get its name. But we really want to do more than that, okay? We care about affordances. Now, once you've got an object that's being hovered, a question is, when the user presses the trigger, what should we do on that object? Should we run some code? If so, what kind of code, okay? What kind of logic should we do? Um, on projects like The Sims, right, you would have this slide object, and then on this slide object, you would have a component, and that component was called an affordance, okay? Um, the affordance, right, in this case would be the slide affordance, and it would have some logic associated with it. It's a chunk of code, okay? It's a class, all right? Same thing with the bathroom. It would have the wait in line affordance, okay? Um, if you look at other games, uh, you can have objects like a note, which will have a read or document affordance on it, okay? You can have doors that have a travel affordance, okay? So the question is, we've got an object. What does it afford us the ability to do, okay? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to create a door like this, okay? And... When I click on the door, I want a message to appear. That's one affordance, okay? We're gonna call it aff message. And then I want a second affordance, which will run. That's gonna be called aff quit, okay? When you click on that exit door, that is what's gonna end the program. And this is actually one of the tasks you need to make for this week, an exit door. And I think you also need to make a light switch and we're gonna do both, okay, right now, all right? Here's what it's gonna look like. We've got our door, right? It's just a cube. It's got one static mesh component, but we're gonna program some additional components, okay? So here is what it's gonna look like. We're gonna have aff message, and we're gonna have aff quit. Both of them will be blueprints. They are gonna derive from a base affordance class, okay? Now these uh, components might have some customizable variables, okay? Some public visible variables so we can actually change what message we want the component to say to us, okay? Now, if you're used to Unity, if you've taken 494 or the Game Engine Architecture course, right? This is how you can customize variables uh, that uh, are being used in your scripts, okay? All right. So the question is, how do we implement these two components? We really wish that we had an easy way to do it, 
right? We've got the event begin play event, right? When does that one run? When does that run? Event begin play. Let's say we put some logic on event begin play. And it's like print message hello. When am I going to see hello? Is it when you start the game? Yeah, exactly. It's when you start the game. It's when you begin play. That's why it's called that. What about event tick? Okay, we got an event, a red node called event tick. Let's say I put a message in there, print, you know, update. When am I going to see that update message? Yeah. Yeah, every frame, every time the game updates, every time it ticks, okay, like a clock, tick, 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 right? It would be really, really cool if we had another event that was event interact. And it would be really cool if it always ran when the user clicked on, pointed at, and then tr pulled the trigger on our object, our actor. Wouldn't that be awesome? We could do this project like super easily, right? No big deal. Well, this doesn't exist. It's a life cycle function that we wish existed, but it doesn't, okay? The question is, could we create it? And the answer is absolutely yes, okay? And that's what we're gonna do. We're creating a new life cycle function, all right? And it's a little bit abstract, but I think you'll get a feel for how it works and why it's so powerful um, once you've played around with it and used it a bit, okay? If it did exist, we could implement the entire AF quit affordance literally in one function, okay? We just take this little line of execution out of our interact event, and we just call the node quit game. Okay, we just call that function. That's it. Super easy. You're already done. So the question is, how do we do this, right? If you want to implement the AF message component, then we can use that interact event. And instead of quitting the game, we can print a string. We can use a public variable so that the user can customize and change the string. And that's that. Okay, just a couple of nodes and we're already done. All right. So we're going to create this lifecycle function. Okay, we're going to get something like this, right? Uh, a light switch. We're going to create an affordance base class that only has one job. It has to have a virtual interact function, okay? And this interact function, we're going to override it in some child classes, okay? Uh, in order to do our job, okay? Um, and then... We just need to make sure that interact function gets called. And that basically creates a new lifecycle event, okay? If all this is confusing, maybe it'll be uh, a little bit more clear uh, when uh, we implement it together, okay? And let's go ahead uh, and let's do that now. So uh, we, have, uh, a, uh, we have a VR pawn here, uh, and um, we've got ourselves printing out the name of the actor. That's all good. Now, I need a door. So let's go ahead and create a door. I'm going to go up to the little plus button up here. Uh, let's go to basic. Let's go ahead and uh, let's see. What can I get? Can I get a shape? Oh, let's go to shape instead. I want a cube. I'm going to just drag it right out here. Okay. So I've got this cool cube right here. It's going to be kind of to our right. I'm going to make it a different size, make it a little bit thinner, more door-like, more frame-like. Uh, I'm going to make it a bit taller. Okay. That looks all right, you think? Make it a little bit, I'm going to embed it in the wall a bit. Hey, that looks like a pretty good door, right? So we've got our door, uh, and I'm actually going to name it a door. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's go exit door. Um, and when you click on this exit door actor and then go to the details pane, this is like the inspector if you've ever used Unity before, um, you'll see that this exit door has one component under it. The static mesh component, we'll talk more about that a bit later on, but this component is a big component, right? It's a, basically a big script that does a ton of things. It renders the object. It handles the physics and collision of the actor, okay? It does so many things. We want to create another component to put on here, okay? 
And um, so what can we do? Well, let's go ahead and create that uh, base affordance class, okay? I'm gonna go into content. Um, let's create a new folder. Uh, let's call this affordances, okay? Inside of this affordances folder, I'm gonna create a new class, okay? In, in Unreal, we'll talk about this more in a bit, but in Unreal, a blueprint and a class, they're the same thing, okay? They're the same thing. They just use slightly different terminology. If you think about it, think back to EX280, EX281. A class is kind of like a blueprint, right? A class is a list of the variables you're going to have, the functions you're going to have, but you can't just have a class. You have to instantiate that class, right? And so a class is basically a blueprint. A blueprint is a class. These are the same things. In Unreal, there's really no difference. So let's create a blueprint class, and I want to create an actor component, okay? I want to create an actor component because I want to be able to attach this class right in there so that it's on the door, okay? Create actor component. I'm going to call this an affordance, okay? We got our affordance class, and now, if you recall what we were going to do with our affordance class, we need a virtual function that will be able to override on all the child classes. So, how do we do that? Let's go create a function the same way that we did on Monday. We're going to click this plus button right here to create a new function. We get to name it. I'm going to name it interact, okay? And we compile. And actually, that's it. That is it. Because what happens when you put a function, uh, a public virtual function, onto a parent class? What happens if you derive from that class? Yeah. Yeah. If you put a function or a variable onto a parent class, any child classes, any derived classes are going to get that stuff, right? Right. And that's exactly what we want. So, Control shift s to save. We're done, all right? We're done with affordance. Now, let's go create a new component, okay? I've got my door right here. I want to add a new affordance component. So, let's go to add. I want to add a uh, new blueprint script component. And it's going to ask me, well, what class do you want to use as the parent class? I'm actually going to go to all classes, and then I'm going to search for affordance, and I find it right there. I'm creating a new affordance class. I'm going to call this aff, right, representing affordance. And I'm going to, uh, what were we doing again? Let's go aff quit. Let's try aff quit, all right? Uh, actually, you know what? No, let's do aff quit. That's fine. So we got aff quit, create blueprint class, okay? And uh, there we go. We've got this new blueprint. We can start coding uh, but I want to use that interact function, right? That interact function is the one that's going to run when we click on an, a, a, an actor. So I'm going to go to my functions. I'm going to go to override, and we're going to override the interact function, okay? So when we interact with this uh, component, what are we going to do? Well, I want to quit the game, okay? And there we go. So when you interact, when the interact function is called on the aff quit component, we will quit the game, okay? So if I uh, look at our door now, it has an aff quit component. And actually, I want to put this into our affordances folder. Move here, okay? Good. Um, so what's going to happen when I point and click at this door? What's going to happen? You want to test it? Okay. Oh, I need my I need my hands here. Hello. Hello. There we are. Okay. So I'm gonna walk over here. Now I'm gonna click on the door. What's gonna happen? Click. What's happening? Basically nothing. Right? Nothing happened. What's the problem? We wrote the interact function, right? 
What's the problem? Why wasn't it working? What do you think? Yeah. Well, we already overrode it, right? We overrode that interact function, okay? There it is. There's the interact function, and there we're calling quit game. The reason this doesn't work is because no one's calling interact. We created an interact function, but we forgot to call it, okay? If no one calls this function, it doesn't matter. It doesn't exist, right? You create a function in x280, but you, fail, you forget to call it? Who cares? Nothing happens. So one of the things that our VR pawn has to do is not only does it need to know which actor are we pointing at, but when the player pulls the trigger, we need to go and we need to grab all the components, all the affordances on that actor, and we need to call interact on them. Okay, we have to do that. That's what brings the lifecycle function to life. All right. Otherwise, it's just a weird a function that we wrote uh, for no reason. So here is the event we can use uh, that runs whenever the player clicks the trigger, okay? Now, I'm actually going to bring that down here uh, so we've got a little bit more space. Um, and what I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check if I've got a valid actor that I'm pointing at, okay? Is my variable current hovered actor, is it null? Uh, is it uh, none? If you're pointing at the sky, it's going to be none, okay? If you're pointing at the door, it'll be the door. Or a sphere, it'll be that sphere. So how do you check if a variable is null or not? If it's null, you can't really use it, right? So how do you know? Well, uh, let's do this. Um, you can use a function called isValid, okay? And it's pretty cool. Um, what you can do is you can plug anything you want into it. So I'm grab my current hovered actor variable. Um, and if this is null, uh, then we will go out the bottom line. If it is valid, however, if it's not null, we'll go out the top line. All right. Um, and so um, we can go ahead and get our little line of execution coming out. Now, once we know that our actor is actually valid, it's not null, we need to get the components on it. Imagine for a second... Imagine that we have clicked on this door actor. So we've clicked on this door actor, which means that that door is literally inside of this variable. Okay, the variable is the door. Now, we don't want just the door. We actually want this component, af quit, that's on it. Okay, how do we get that? How do we get the component? Well, what you can do is you can say, you know what, um, I want to take this hovered actor, and I'm going to clean up my lines a little bit maybe, and I want to get the component on that actor. So let's write get component, and look at that. It shows right up. Get components by class, okay? Well, what kind of components do you want to get? Oh, I want to get... Let's see, I want to get all affordance components. So any component that was derived from affordance, we're about to get. We're going to get it in the form of this array. I want to iterate through that array, so let's create a for each loop, okay? I'm going to go through each component, okay? All right, I'm going to go through each component, and what should we do with each component? So in this array, we're going to have every single component that we put on here. Af quit, af message, you know, af toggle, whatever. But what do we do once we have the component? What do you got? What do you think we should do? Jacob? Um, probably... Is it, it passed already? Yes, so we just, in our code, in our script, we got a reference to the door. Now we've used the for each loop to go through all of our components, okay? And we want that component to do something. So we need to do something with the component, right? 
If you've forgotten what this component looks like, internally it has a function called interact, and we've set up some cool code to make the component work on that interact function. So once we've got our component, what do we need to call on the component? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? You need to call interact. If you want interact to ever do something, it has to be called somewhere, okay? Do you know why we have uh, these lovely event tick and be event begin play events? You know why they work? It's because Unreal Engine is calling them. Some Unreal developer in North Carolina wrote some code buried in the engine to call those functions on your behalf automatically at certain times. Well, now you're doing that as well, okay? Now we have an interact function, but it's just a function. We need to call it, okay? Otherwise, it's pointless. So um, when the player presses trigger, we're going to check if the thing we're pointing at has any components of type affordance. And for every one that we find, we're going to call that interact function just like that, okay? All right. It's a little bit abstract, isn't it? It can be hard to think about, but you will get better at it, and the power that this approach brings will be clear very soon. So what's going to happen when I click on that door now? Hello? Is it frozen? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we need uh, the browser anymore. Oh, oh, is it back? All right, yeah, it was just chilling, I guess, just taking its time. Um, all right, so I'm going to point at this door. Are you ready? I click, and there we go. Okay, if that seems a bit magical or confusing, wait, why did that happen? Let's run through it again really, really quickly. Okay. Every single frame, the VR pawn, which represents the player, has its event tick function. It's event tick event fire, okay? We go into this function, and we use a line trace to find what actor have you pointed at, all right? Um, now, this actor gets put into the current hovered actor variable, uh, and so this variable can be used. Down here, when I press trigger, we get execution coming out here. We check if that variable is valid, like yes, you're pointing at an actor. We then grab all of its components. So all of these components, if it has any, right, the wall has no component, the door does, okay? Um, we grab those components and we're gonna call interact on them. Now we know those components have an interact function, right, see, there it is. And the reason is because the parent class has an interact function, okay? If the parent class has an interact function, then we know all the child classes will, guaranteed, okay? This is called polymorphism. It doesn't matter what kind of component you have, we know that all components have an interact function because the interact function is in the parent class, okay? And so we can always call interact. Interact might do different things, in each different component, but we're guaranteed that each component has an interact function, okay? And so, what can we do now? Well, we just wrote a component, afquit, where the interact function causes you to quit the game. But what if we want something different? What if we want to print a particular message, okay? Well, let's do that. I'm going to um, remove, oops, I'm gonna remove this uh, afquit component Let's add a new one, okay? Let's go create a new AF component. I'm going to derive from affordance, and I'm going to call this AF message, okay? All right? Now, this is another affordance blueprint, another affordance class, and so we know we can override interact. Here it is. And when we override interact, you know, what should this, uh, what should this component do? What should this affordance do? It should print a message, right? So let's go grab that print node. So print a string, okay? What kind of string should it print? 
do you have any particular message that you want to uh, to put to the screen when we click on the door? Like goodbye or something? But maybe it should be like, you know, sayonara, right? Or ciao. Well, we want the user to be able to customize the message, okay? And so how do we do that? Let's create a variable. Let's call this message to print. And currently it's a Boolean data type. I want this to be a string, right? Okay, we can now bring this variable right in and we can plug it in just like that. We can click on, um, actually hold on a sec. Oh, I made a local variable. We don't wanna make a local variable. Let's make a normal variable, okay? Let's call this message to print. And do you see this little closed eye right here? This closed eye, if I open that eye up, if I click it, it will become customizable. It's gonna become visible in our inspector, in our details pane. I'll go ahead and compile, and then we've got that AF message right in there. But would you look at that? Right here on our details page, we have a message to print variable that we can customize, okay? So think about it this way. Imagine that you're on an Unreal Engine team, you're making some sort of product, and you're the only engineer. Uh-oh. You've got like five designers though. Okay, they're building content, but they don't know how to program. Well, if you want them to be able to customize the message, they might all want different messages, okay? You will go into the component and you'll make sure that this variable is there and it's public because now your designers can specify any message that they want. And you don't have to go in and hard code anything, okay? They just do it, all right? They don't even need to go into the code to customize the message. That variable is now visible and you can change its value right here. So let's go uh, ciao, right? Okay, let's go ahead and see if it, uh, if it works, right? I'll need your help to see what the message is, okay? Uh, let's see, control Y, launch Unreal Engine. Cool. Okay. So I'm gonna go to the door. Oh, I'm. Oh, we're spamming. Uh, we're spamming other messages, aren't we? Okay. I'm gonna go in and fix that really quickly. Uh, let's go into our little code editor. Let's go into VR Pawn. So every frame, we're printing the name of the thing that we're hovering. We no longer need this because we're pretty sure it's working pretty well. Control Shift S. Let's go to compile. Okay, now let's run the game again. Okay. All right, ready? Click, 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 click. Okay, what do you see? What message is showing up? Yeah, okay. Now, one really cool thing about components is that we can take these affordances and we can put them on anything we want, okay? So imagine that we want the door to say ciao when we interact with it, but this cube over here, we want it to say something different. Um, let's go grab the AF message of words. Actually, I'm gonna move it to a different folder here. Okay, there we go. Um, what if we want a different message on the cube? Well, I can just grab AF message and just pull it right over. And then what happens if we want this sphere to quit the game? I can click on this sphere and I can just bring it over just like that, okay? This cube should have a, a custom message. So how about goodbye from the cube, okay? And this is ciao, uh, click on the component ciao from the door, okay? And then what about this sphere? Uh, this sphere should probably have a, a message on it. Um, let's say, what should the message be? Okay, um, Ending the game now, sphere, okay? All right, let's play the game and see what happens. Okay, I'm gonna go to the door, okay? And click, 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 what does that say? Do you see the message? What is it? 
Okay, chow from the road. That's what we expected. Okay, the cube. Okay, ready? What is it saying? Goodbye, Goodbye from the cube and then the sphere. I click it and the game ends. Okay. Uh, the sphere prints the message and then it ends the game. So you see the sphere is actually pretty interesting because we have multiple components on the sphere, multiple affordances, and they will all get to run. Okay, so pretty cool stuff. However, um, the message isn't that important, right? Because who cares about the blue message showing up? What about this? Let's make a light switch, okay? How can we make a light switch using this affordance system uh, that we've come up with? Um, well, you know what? We're about halfway through, so let's take five minutes, throw some music on, and then we'll come back, we'll build a light switch, and we'll finish this thing up. Okay, see you then. I have a question. Yeah. So the affordance class, does yeah. it follow the, like, does it go with the object or, like, with this? Um, this affordance class right here. Um, when you click on it, you can see what its parent is, actor component. Um, and so, when we create other classes that derive from affordance, right, these two, for instance, okay, um, that means that we can attach these classes, as many as we want, actually, to any actor that we want, okay? Because it's uh, actor, it's also from the actor's... Yes. Oh. Well, it's an actor component. Yeah. Um, so components are kind of unique. And if you're not used to them, it can be a bit confusing. Components are basically when you have a chunk of logic and you want to attach it to a certain thing in a game or an app. Okay? Um, so that's how you'll do it. You write a little bit of logic. You put it into these little packages we call components. And then you say, oh, I want that logic to run uh, over on this door. But then this pretzel, I want it to have this logic and that logic, right? So that's why components are so powerful. You build a tiny bit of reusable logic and then you can pop it onto as many things as you want super easily. What if, like, two of the things you uh, draw into the components space? If yep. Uh, all of those have different uh, drag. Like, yeah. They still do. Yeah, it'll still work. In fact, in just a bit, what we're going to do is we're going to create a light switch, and I'll put on an AF message component, but then I'll also put on an AF toggle component. Both components will run and do their thing. Both of them get interact called, and the reason is right here. Okay? Our VR pawn, right? Yeah. Our VR pawn grabs all of the components of type affordance and then we iterate through each of them and we call that interact function on all of them so all of the components get to run as long as they're in affordance okay yeah
Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get back to it. Our mission right now is to program a light switch. And in order for us to really um, make that impactful, we need to create some darkness, okay? Right now, if you look at this area, it's kind of like very bright. We're out in the open, uh, and I'm thinking that we should enclose this, okay? So grab that Control V to copy and paste it, um, and I'm just gonna drag this over like that, um, and suddenly it's quite a bit darker, okay? Um, now, Control S uh, to uh, Control Shift S to save that. Let's go ahead and get some additional lights. I want some cool point lights. Now, look at that. Um, Unreal as an engine is famous just for, like, things just kind of look really good in it, um, like, by default. You basically don't even have to try that hard, um, and things already look pretty good. The lighting is just fantastic. Um, so we now have these two lights, and when they're both on, uh, they do a pretty good job of illuminating the space, okay? Um, but I think, uh, let me see here, um, what happens, I forget, uh, how, how, do, can we, how can we turn this off, I think? I think uh, there's a way, to, oh, right here, okay, on, over here. So what happens uh, if we turn these lights off while well, it gets noticeably darker, right? If we turn them both off, then it gets quite dark, okay? And things look pretty well lit up when they're both on. So we need some sort of interaction that's going to allow us to turn those lights off and then turn it back on, right? Flip the light switch. So let's create an actor first. Then we'll put some components on that actor uh, to allow us to turn the light switch off and on. So let's go ahead and create a little basic cube, okay? Here's our cube. Now this is way too big. I'm gonna make it smaller, a little bit more like a light switch. Hopefully I can hit it. Um, and maybe I'll put it into the wall a little bit. Let's say that this right here is the light switch, okay? Now if this were P1, you might give it some different graphics or a slightly different shape to make it look a bit more convincing. But this is a, a serviceable light switch and I'm gonna name it like that, light switch, okay? Um, so, if we want this to turn the lights off or on, we should create a new affordance that can do that, okay? Now, we could create an affordance called AF light switch, but actually, we should make it a little bit more general than that, okay? Um, we really just want the ability to turn any specified object off or on, off or on. So we won't mention light switches in our code or in the name of our component. We're gonna go with something more general. I wanna create a new blueprint component of type affordance, okay? A new affordance we're creating. I'm gonna call this AF toggle actor, okay? Or toggle actors because we wanna specify multiple, okay? Now here's our new component. Like all the others, we can go and start by overriding our interact function, um, and then we can say, well, if we want to flip or hide some objects, how do we do that? Well, we need to specify a variable. We want this a variable, let's call it, um, let's call this actors to toggle. We'll make it public, and we'll also change the type to not Boolean, uh, but actor. And actually, we don't want a single actor, we want multiple actors. So let's turn this uh, into uh, an actor variable, and then let's change its type to an array, okay? So we'll go up here, I'm gonna set this to array. We could also do a set or a map. Quick question, does anyone know the difference between an array and a set? They sound very similar, don't they? Yeah. Sets don't allow duplicates. Bingo. A set does not allow any duplicates, all right? Now we could choose set here, but I'm actually just gonna choose a normal array. That's just fine. So when we interact with this light switch, when this affordance has its interact function called, what do we want to do? Well, we wanna iterate through all those actors, right? So let's go ahead and grab that actors variable. It's an array, so let's use a for each loop to go through it. 
And what do we want to do? Well, let's set them all to be hidden. Let's make them go away. Okay, that's a good first start. Um, can we set actor hidden? Bingo. I think this is the one we want. Okay. Uh, and new hidden, uh, whether or not to hide the actor and all its components, let's set that to true. Okay. All right. We'll compile. Uh, and when we come back out to the light switch, you can see our new component, right? Our new uh, affordance is right there on the switch. So when we click on it, we see that there's the actors to toggle variable, okay? Remember, whenever we have a variable like actors to toggle and we make that little eye open, it's now a public variable. We can now change it right there in the inspector, right there in the details pane. Okay, hello, let's go back. Click. Okay, there we are. Um, and so I wanna add a few actors. I wanna add two of them. And I'm actually, uh, I actually want to drag these lights right in. Now, I can go through this list until I find the lights, and I can do that. Um, or I want to drag them in. So I'm going to click on this little lock, and I'm going to click on my point light. I'm going to drag the point light right in, okay? I'm going to click on the other point light. I'm going to drag that light right in, okay? So I also, maybe I want to print a message to make sure it's working. So how can I do that? I'm going to add on another uh, affordance. Let's go over here. Uh, where's my F message affordance? There it is. Okay. And what message should I print? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to print toggled lights. Okay. Woohoo. Okay. So the lights should turn off and we should see this big message because all of our affordances are going to get to run when we click on that actor. Okay. I'm going to turn off my lock the lock basically keeps the details pane, the inspector, focused on whatever actor you currently have, okay? Um, anyway, uh, I also, uh, let me see, where did my affordance go? Here we are. I'm going to drag this affordance into the affordances folder uh, so that we can uh, be nice and, very, and, and clean, okay? Clean code base, clean project. Okay, so what's going to happen when I interact with this light switch? Two things, right? What's going to happen? Okay, the lights turn off and and you print a message. That's right. So let's test it out. Um, we expect it should get a bit darker, okay? So we got our lights up there. They're looking pretty good. I'm going to click this and look at that. Oh, but when I click it a second time, we don't come back, right? When we click it a second time, the lights don't turn back on. So that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Well, what are we going to do? We can go to the toggle actors component. I can right click and go to edit to edit the component. Clearly, this is not quite good enough, right? If the component was instead called AF disable actors, then it, we'd be finished, right? But no, this is for a light switch. So we click it to turn things off, then we click it to turn things back on, right? So what can we do here? Clearly, our code needs to be a little bit more complex, right? What can we do? Add what? Add a branch. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Let's add a branch. So if things are turned off, we can turn them back on. Uh, if things are turned on, we can turn them off. Okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, usually, we actually, I usually do a different thing. I usually create a Boolean uh, that helps me track uh, whether things are currently turned off or currently turned on. But I wonder, can I check if the light is turned on or not? I, uh, I wonder, I wonder if I can. Let's, let's see. Um, so get hidden. Um, maybe I, is it visible? Can we check? Set actor hidden in game, um, was actor recently rendered? Maybe that's good enough. Um, visible, uh, let's go hidden. Oh, here we are, get actor hidden in game, okay? So this, this node, I think, is gonna tell us, um, okay, okay, 
uh, I think it's going to uh, tell us whether or not the actor is visible. So what should we do? We should negate this Boolean, and then we should plug it in, okay? So hopefully, this will be the logic, okay? Look at the first actor in the list. You know, is it visible? If, it's not vi if it is visible, then make it not visible. If it's not visible, make it visible. And we're going to do that for everything in our list, which means two lights, okay? All right, let's go and try it. This is not how I usually implement this, but maybe it'll work really well. I don't know. Let's see. Okay, ready? Click, and it turns off. Fantastic. Click, and on. Off, on, off, on. Heck yeah. Is that cool or what? And that wasn't that hard, right? I mean, we only needed a handful of nodes. Uh, and if I wasn't explaining things, like, we could have coded that in like just a couple seconds, really. Okay, well, you know what? Um, I'm not quite convinced yet, okay? I want to do one more affordance, okay? Now, I want, um, I want something that's a little bit more uh, maybe uh, patriotic for Michigan, okay? This is the computer science department. So here's what I want. I want a poster, but when you click on the poster, it takes you to the CSE uh, webpage, okay? Um, so I've got my poster image right here. I've got a new block to represent the big poster on the wall. I'm going to drag it right there. Look at that. That's sweet, huh? Okay. Um, this block already has an AF message and AF uh, toggle actors on it. I'm going to get rid of those. The reason those were there is because I duplicated the light switch, Okay, this is not a light switch. It should not be named light switch. So I'm going to change this uh, to poster. Okay, now we need to launch a URL uh, when we interact with this poster. So uh, what are we uh, what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to create a new affordance. Okay, by the way, basically this entire class, the answer to every question is create an affordance. Okay. Or not, not every question, but many of them. Create an affordance or create a component, okay? So let's create an affordance. What, what should we call this? What's a good name? What do you think? We're, we're trying to open a URL here. What should we call this affordance? Yeah, AF open URL. Sure, why not, okay? Open URL, okay? Sweet. Like every affordance ever, we're going to override that interact function. And we do that because then this thing gets called for free exactly when we want it, right? It's perfect. Let's see if there's anything related to URL. I type URL. Look at launch URL. Nice, okay? It takes a string, which shouldn't be surprising. You know, it's the URL that we want to go to. Now, this component, this affordance is not f go to Umich website, right? It is F open URL. So should we hard code the CSE website right here? What is the CSE website? Here it is. Should we just copy and paste this right into here like that? Should we do that? Okay, what should we do instead? What's better? Yeah, let's create a variable of type string. We're going to make it public. We'll open that eye. And now anyone can choose what URL they want, okay? And it can be different URLs. We could have multiple posters and different URLs uh, that they take you to. Okay, so let's go create a variable. Uh, we want it. Let's call this uh, URL to open. And I'm going to change this to a string data type because it has to be a URL. And I'm going to open the eye here. Now I can grab this variable, just drag it right over and plug it in. Uh, and now uh, we will get whatever URL that we decide to set. So when I look at this AF open URL component, we now have this variable. I can just plug in the CSE website, control shift S, and let's see what happens. So I usually don't do this example in, uh, in class, so I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen. This is another task you have to do, by the way. So we're basically we're basically done. Okay, ready? Click. Okay, did anything happen? Yes. Oh, really? Oh, I can't see it in here. 
oh, nice. But it worked, right? Cool. Very good. Um, in a commercial grade application, you would want to launch this URL and then probably you'd want a message box or something to say, hey, take the headset off so you can enjoy the website, right? Um, oh, speaking of enjoying websites, uh, let me see here. We had our first few students clear the uh, the x440.com uh, website game, uh, at which point they got uh, stickers. So if you clear it, and show it to me, or better yet, record it uh, and prove it, uh, you'll get a sticker as well, okay? Apparently, like, some people who aren't in my classes were playing the game, and they wanted stickers. So they, they used their friends who were in my classes to get stickers. So I guess you can get, anyone can get a sticker, I guess. I got, like, 70 of them, so it's not a big deal. Uh, anyway, um, okay, so there you go. So I hope this demo has kind of proven the power of what we've built Okay, like, yeah, maybe it was a bit complicated to set this up, right? We had to adjust our VR pawn. We had to get a line trace going so we know what we're hovering. We have to get the trigger being detected. We have to grab all those affordance components and call their interact function, okay? But once you've got this going, like, it takes seconds to build new functionality. It's incredible, right? I mean, we basically built this uh, URL web page opening feature in like less than 30 seconds, okay? It would have been like five seconds if I wasn't kind of explaining it and asking questions. So this is the power of setting up a good architecture that is a good fit for the application you're making, all right? And as you work your way through project one, there are going to be, oh, did I freeze? Uh, I think I froze my computer. What happened? Control out, delete. Uh-oh. Control, delete is not working. Maybe if I unplug here? Well, in any case, uh, be all of about, uh, can we, uh, oh, oh, there it goes. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, okay. Hey, it's back. Good job. All right. Wonderful. Um, it's going to be, uh, a lot of your work on this first project is going to be, hey, can we write a new component? Can we create a new affordance uh, that's going to get the job done for us? I'll warn you, sometimes affordances are not quite the answer. Because sometimes uh, you want to run some logic uh, that, you know, triggers at a different time. Okay? You don't want to run logic and interact. You want to constantly be running logic. So in that case, you don't need to do an affordance. You just do a normal component, okay? And you use event tick. But also, um, you remember the whiteboard, right? Did you see the whiteboard? How you can draw on the whiteboard smoothly just by holding the trigger down. Does interact do that for you? No. That interact function that we just set up is like click, 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 click. You have to click, right? you'll have to implement a new version of interact called continuous interact, which will fire boom, 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 every frame that you're holding the trigger and pointing at something, okay? That's going to be a bit harder. You're going to have to set that up yourself, okay? But it's kind of similar to the way that you set up interact. Oh. Anyway, um, you'll probably have other affordances you eventually write like AF advanced dialogue. When you're talking to an NPC and you click on them, new dialogue comes up, the old dialogue goes away. You might need AF play sound. So when you click on something like the fire alarm, it'll play a sound, okay? Um, and, uh, and stuff like that. You'll probably have an affordance called AF advanced time, which will cause the time of day to progress uh, whenever you click on the thing, okay? Um, in project one, basically every time you interact with an object or a light or a fire alarm or whatever, an uh, NPC, you need to make the sun progress, go up or maybe it's going down, okay? And that's how time proceeds. Anyway, do any of you have any questions about what we did today? So if you're just getting started with P1, if you don't have all this working yet, go look at Monday's lecture and watch that lecture, uh, but then go look at um, Wednesday, Okay. Uh oh, I don't. I think maybe we're not streaming. Uh, I just look kind of weird right here. Is it doing anything? Okay, I'm gonna kill the stream. <laughs>